This video we're going to look at Revit and just do a little bit of a basic kind of home design. It's going to be split into two parts, one in which we're just going to look a little bit at what templates to use and the interface of Revit. We'll put in our walls, our doors, and all of our openings or our windows, and most likely a floor and a roof as well within part one. And then in part two, we'll focus on putting in stairways, railings, components, the site itself, and also working on renderings and how those kind of come into play. So this is the house that we will be building. It is very incredibly inspired from a house design that the Balkan architect does in some of his videos. I've mentioned him many times in class and I encourage you to go check out his videos because he is phenomenal. And I'm just gonna close out of it. And so that way we can start off with a brand new drawing. One thing of note before we get going is that I am using Revit 2024. Depending on when you're watching this video, you may be using a different version, but I'm gonna hold on to these videos for as long as possible until I need to re-record them with a new version. So in videos, when you're looking at them, you may find people refer to projects instead of a model. And that is just kind of like a new, um, new vernacular that Autodesk has put out within Revit. So any, they used to be called projects, they're now called models. These are just our buildings themselves and everything that's going within them. And then families are things like our doors, our windows, our furniture, our cabinetry. Those are all just the different parts that are going in. You'll also notice them based on their file type. So a model is an RVT file type and a family is gonna be an RFA file type. We're not gonna do anything with families or making new families in this course at all, but what we are gonna do is a new model. So I'm gonna click on new for the model. There is this new template in 2024, which I haven't played around with a lot, so I'm not very good with it, um, called the multi-discipline template. We are not gonna use that one. Instead, I'm gonna click on browse and I'm just gonna use a completely default template. I like the default one because there isn't too much built into it already, which means we can play around with it and make it kind of our own if we need to. So I'm gonna click on open for that. And then it's also gonna ask if we wanna make a new project or a new project template. We just only wanna make a new project. A project template could be something that we build in custom walls and features and things like that, but we're not gonna make any a new template we're just going to keep a new project so we'll click OK and that's going to launch us into the floor plan in 2024 because my computer is set into dark mode Revit launched in dark mode as well but I can easily switch it into just a white background if I use the keyboard shortcut CA so every keyboard shortcut in Revit is going to be two letters instead of our, what we're used to in AutoCAD with it being just one singular letter in there. The important things to keep in mind with our user interface of Revit is that we are building a three-dimensional model. And so what we're going to do is build within a particular view, but everything that we do like in the floor plan would get transferred into a section, would get transferred into elevations. Everything's gonna be just one comprehensive 3D model kind of as we're building it out. We can switch between those views down here in the project browser. So we have our floor plans and my level one and my level two. We have ceiling plans, which I often click on that little minus sign to close them out. So I don't, don't accidentally go into a ceiling plan when I mean to go into a floor plan. We have some elevation views that we can go into. These symbols right here are just elevations that have been given to us. So there are elevation markers. So this would be our west one. And if I wanted to look at the west elevation, I can either double click on it in my project browser. And we see here now that it opened up another tab for the west. And I can go back and forth between my open views up here in my tabs. Additionally, I could go into my west elevation by double clicking on that symbol and that brings me into it. And vice versa, I can go into the floor plan by double clicking on the symbol 
for it in that spot elevation for whichever level I'm going into. Um, but our project browser is pretty important. I don't recommend you close out of it, but just in case you do accidentally click on this X or something and it goes away, you can right click anywhere in the project browser and there is browsers or in the drawing space rather. And there's browsers, project browser to open it back up. And the other thing that's really important in our interface is our properties bar. So our properties bar is gonna tell us information about whatever we currently have selected. So in this case, I don't have anything selected. So it's just telling me information about the floor plan itself. And so I now know what scale I'm in, the detail level I have, things like that. I can adjust things related to its visibility and its graphics, which we'll play around with a little bit today. And then once I start drawing walls and doors and adding features, the properties bar is gonna change based on whatever command I'm currently in. The properties bar is also something that I super duper don't recommend you close out of, but in case you do, again, if you click on that X by accident and close out of it, you can get the properties bar back by right clicking and opening up properties, or you can also use the command PP to bring it back. That's a fun one <laughs> to do. So if you get rid of it, you can get either of those back, but I super recommend that you just keep them open on and I even recommend just keeping them here stacked on the side at the very bottom of our property or our kind of our drawing section rather we've got a few different settings that we can play around with while we work things related to our visual styles our scale cropping our view as well as here so this is going to be stuff related to how we're going to kind of present it on a piece of paper and then of course we have our toolbar up at the top, which is going to be primarily how we get to draw our different parts or our different features. Um, so within this toolbar, we have quite a few tools that are pretty obvious of what they're gonna be doing and some of them not so much. They all do have keyboard shortcuts to them, but remember, as I mentioned before, all keyboard shortcuts in Revit have two keys set to them. We have a few different tabs too that we can go through based on particularly what we are gonna be creating. Um, we are not gonna have time in this course to go over every single tool and every single command, but just to let you know that they are there. We're gonna spend a bulk of the course in the architecture tab. We're also gonna use the annotate tab quite a lot because this is how we can get a lot of those details in. We'll do some massing and some sites, and then we'll play around a little bit, hopefully, with the Analyze tab, if we have time to look at all of those features in there. Now, because with this first practice, I don't want to put too much information in the very first thing that we do, we are going to create this that two-level building, and we're going to kind of keep it a little bit loose when it comes to a lot of stuff like our dimensions. But since we are going to have two levels, what we want to do is actually add an additional level to our plans or to our drawing. So to add levels into the drawing, we need to be in an elevation view or a section view, but we don't have a section view currently made yet. So we can go into any of these four elevation views. It's not going to matter which one. And we can see here that we have an elevation for our level one which I'm actually gonna rename to our ground level. To do that, I'm just going to click on it once and then hover over the name and click on it again. And I'm gonna rename this to 00 ground. And we'll see too in my floor plan here, it also automatically renamed it to the ground level. Then I'm going to rename level two here by just clicking on it once highlighting or hovering over to get a box around the name. And I'm gonna call this one 01 upper level. And then I'm gonna make an additional level here called my roof. So it's gonna be essentially a constraint where I can say where I want my walls to stop and where I want my walls to go up to. And so to make a new level, the button for it's gonna be in the architecture tab and then we have the button here for level, or it is keyboard shortcut LL. And when I go to make a new level, 
we can see that my toolbar has adjusted slightly and I have this blue guide line here, this blue dimension for where I kind of want to place it based on a height off of the first level. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do mine 10 foot. So I'm just going to hold my scroll wheel to pan over and I'm going to align it here. There's no rule saying that I have to, but I just like to keep all of my stuff organized. And then I'm going to pan over to make it so that this way all of my spot elevations and all of my heights are just kind of organized here. I'll hit escape twice to end the command. And then I'm just going to call this one. I'm going to call it level two roof. The names that you give them have no relation to how they actually function, but it's just helpful always, just like with AutoCAD, to name something so you know exactly what it is. Um, the reason why I put numbers in front of all of my levels, and this is something I consistently do, is so that this way they're organized in here. They're going to organize them floor plan in this floor plan based off of them alphabetically. And so I just kind of want it to be my lowest level going up into my highest one when I have them listed here on the side. If I wanted to change the heights that they're sitting at, I can click on any one of those levels and I can either drag it up to a specific height or I can also click on the number itself and I can change the height. Revit, unlike AutoCAD, Revit is going to be assuming that you are doing things based off of feet. So if I just type in 20 without putting in a foot marker, it's going to do 20 feet. If I wanted to do 20 foot 6 inches, I could do 20 space 6. Revit's automatically going to infer my very first number was the foot, and it's going to assume the next number is the inches. Additionally, I can change those levels here in the property bar. I can change that elevation that it's sitting at. But I do just want to keep mine at 20 for the time being. So next, I'm going to start to add in features like my walls. So before I can put any openings, like a door or a window, I have to have a wall listed in there first. So I'm going to go back into my lowest level, my ground, by either double clicking on that spot elevation, or I could come to it over here, or I could click on it here since I already have it open, and I'm ready to make a wall. So I'm just going to hit escape twice so I get back into my regular architecture tab here. And I'm going to use the wall tool, which is right here, or keyboard shortcut WA. When I go into the wall tool, again, my toolbar up at the top completely changes based on what I'm creating. And then my properties bar has also changed. And I have a couple of quick settings here that I can either adjust within this green toolbar or I can adjust them over here in my properties bar. The things we always want to pay attention to are things like our base constraint and our top constraint, which essentially is saying what is going to be the lowest level of this building and what's going to be the highest level of this building or rather even this wall, this section of the wall. So because I'm in the ground floor plan, the base constraint has been automatically set to the ground. And for my top constraint, by default, it's set to be an unconnected height. So it's not going up to any particular level and it's gonna be 20 foot tall. And so I wanna adjust that. I'm going to change this top constraint from unconnected to say that I want this wall to go up to the very next level, which would be upper level. And you don't actually ever have to click apply here. Once you move your cursor out of the properties bar, it automatically applies that. We could also adjust our um, top constraint up here if we wanted to just quickly without going through this. And then our location line is often gonna be pretty helpful. We're not gonna worry about that within this particular building because we are just gonna kind of play around with some of the sizes and things. But we could do it based off of just the center of the wall when we're typing in amounts. We could do it based off of finishes faces or core faces is often what I build things off of. So that way I can dimension to things like my studs rather than dimensioning to the middle of a wall or dimensioning to the very outside of it. But I'll just leave it alone at wall center line. 
And what I'm gonna do is build out a rectangle for my first floor within the area of my four elevations here. So I'm just gonna start clicking. I'm gonna make it, since I can make it kind of any size I want, I can either drag my cursor to the amount of feet I want, or I can even type in, like I want 30 foot by 15 foot. I'm just gonna make a 30 by 15 rectangle here. And so one thing we'll see or notice is that Revit is automatically just applying that offset to our wall for our wall thickness based on the wall that we've chose. And it's also trimming and joining those walls together, which is pretty nice and pretty helpful. If we wanted to do a different wall type, we can easily switch our wall to a different type or a different feature. So in my properties bar right now, I'm making just a generic eight inch wall. That's what it came up with by default. But if I click on that, we have a couple of other types of walls. So I can do other types of generic walls, whether I'm just concepting something out like we are today, or we can even define all of the different layers within a wall and add those in. So I'm going to switch myself over to this generic five inch wall. And I'm just going to put in like a little bathroom space here in this corner. And I'm just going to eyeball it into place. And you'll see too that we get that blue um, guide coming out for our dimension. And I'm just going to make like a six foot by seven foot space. The nice thing is, after I've placed these walls, if I hit escape twice and I decide I wanna move it, I can click on this wall and I can move this dimension. So if I wanted it to now be eight foot, I can move it and I can adjust it. So Revit has a lot more freedom within that to help us sort of play around with some of these um, sizes and some of these features. Additionally, then I'm gonna put in a little sunroom over here on this side of the building. So I am gonna use the wall tool to do that. So I'm gonna go back into my wall tool, either clicking on the button at the top or WA for the command. You'll notice when I start the command up, it kept all of the settings from what I last did. So it automatically put me in a generic five inch wall because that was the last wall that I ever placed and it already put the base and top constraints based on what I last did. So Revit's always remembering your last settings and trying to reuse them. And I'm gonna switch my wall type, so I'm gonna click on where it says the generic five inch wall. And I'm gonna scroll down and I'm actually gonna place a curtain wall this time around. Curtain walls are essentially glass walls or just big window features. And I often like using this storefront one because it's gonna build out mullions for us automatically. When we do our commercial practice, we'll do some curtain walls where they don't build out our mullions. And I'll also show you today a way that I like to do walls um, or windows rather, but I use the curtain wall feature to do windows. It's a one way that you could potentially, or another way you could use it. So I'm gonna click on the storefront option my base level is already set to ground. My top constraint is already set to level one. And I'm just gonna do a curtain wall from this point. I'm gonna go out about, I'll do 12 feet. And I'm gonna go straight down and notice too how it's going to show me where these two would intersect nicely. And then I have a curtain wall or a glass wall kind of built out here. Before we start to with the second story, We'll just look at kind of what our first story or our, what our 3D building rather entails based on our floor plan. And so to look at our building three-dimensionally, I'm gonna click on this little oblique style building up here. And that's gonna bring me into the three-dimensional view. And I'll just zoom in for a bit. And if I wanna orbit around, I can hold the shift key and hold down my scroll wheel. And I can orbit to kind of look at my building and see if it's kind of taking the form that I would like or I would prefer. If I wanna change the visual style of what I'm looking at currently in this particular view, I'm gonna click on this oblique cube down here. And right now I'm in hidden line. And if I switch myself over to shaded or consistent colors is another one that I like. 
what this is going to do is just kind of show my building in a little bit more of a realistic look. Granted, right now I just have generic gray walls, but later on we could define them if we want to. And then I have my little glass piece over here. So next, I'm going to work on my second story of this building. So I'm going to go into my upper level floor plan by just double clicking on it here. And what it's done for us is it's built out um, a half tone version of level one. So this is actually called an underlay. The intention of it is so that way I could trace over it if I need to for level two. Additionally, um, if I'm going to have some type of load bearing wall that's going to need to be double stacked within here, I can make sure that those walls are sitting in line with each other or on top of each other. Um, Right now, we're gonna keep it here, and then after we build out our level two, we're gonna actually turn that overlay off. So to start off my level two walls, I'm gonna go into the wall command, which again, I can use the button all the way in the top left, or the keyboard shortcut WA. Revit has automatically put me into the curtain wall storefront that I used last time, which I don't want this time. So I'm going to switch myself from the storefront back into the generic eight inch wall. And we'll see too that here with my base constraint and my top constraint, Revit has also put the base constraint as my upper level, since I'm now in the upper level floor plan. And it's also adjusted the top constraint to go up to the level roof. Because Revit's making an assumption that if the last time I made walls, I had them one story high. I'm probably going to want these ones to be one story high as well. Um, if it assumed wrong, I could easily change it. But in this fact, or in this case, it didn't assume anything wrong. So what I'm going to do next is just draw out a slightly larger second story. Um, it was kind of cantilevered up and or on the upper level. What we can do, we can do that in a couple of different ways. One would be is we can actually use this offset command here or this offset feature. And I could say that like, I wanna go two feet and what's gonna happen when I hit enter is when I go to start drawing, even though I'm drawing directly on top of this wall, it's going two foot out, which is kind of nice, kind of helpful. The other thing I could do, so I'm just gonna control Z to undo that, is I could also build out a rectangle rather than just only build out lines. We've been using this line tool, but we can actually change what we're drawing and how we're drawing with walls. So if I wanted a curved wall, I could switch to this arc and I could start curving walls if I needed to. But let me hit escape again, because I don't wanna do that. I'm going to do WA to get back into wall. I'm going to draw out a rectangle. So I'm going to use the rectangle one. I'm just going to start it somewhere. And then just make kind of like a bigger rectangle. Because what I can do after the fact, as I mentioned, is now I can hit escape a bunch of times to exit the command, is I can click on this wall and I could type in a specific amount of how much I wanted that to be out. So let's actually do three foot instead of two foot. I'll click on this one. I'll do three foot, this one. I'm just gonna make it an even three foot offset on all sides. And so now I have walls on my second story that are three foot out from the walls on my first level. So we're going to go into the little 3D view again, just to kind of look at this and see what it looks like. Now, in the quick look that I showed you for the building at the very beginning of the video, the wall that was on this side was actually a curtain wall. And so I can change after the fact, in any particular view, I can click on a wall or I can click on a feature and I can change its properties. So if I wanted this wall instead to be a curtain wall, I can just select it and come over here and switch it to a storefront curtain wall. And now it is that curtain wall instead. 
One thing that I mentioned the very first day we started with Revit 2 is that as you're building the whole model, as you're making the floor plan, the elevations are coming along with you. And so if we go into the east elevation, we can see our building kind of starting out. We go into the north one, we can see our building again. So we can see all of these elevations coming together as we create our structure, which is really nice. So the next thing I just want to look at are some of the openings, mainly our doors and our windows and how we can add those into buildings. So I'm going to go back into my ground floor floor plan. So I'm going to go into double click on ground and I'm going to add a door on this side, a door here. I'm also going to add a door into the curtain wall and put a door or two into my bathroom. And you might have guessed the way that we add doors into our building is through the door tool. So I'm going to come over here and click on door or type in the keyboard shortcut DR. And when I go into this command, it's going to bring up a whole new menu of these different parts or different menu related to this part. And within my properties, I can switch into different door types. So I have just this single flush door, it's the only door loaded into my default template, but we have it based on width and height in a couple of different areas. And we can even customize this if we want. If there is a specific door that I want to load in to it that isn't within the project, I can come up here to load family and I can choose from the content library. The content library is not loaded into Revit by default. So if you have put Revit on your laptop, you need to download the content library separately to install all of the different um, pieces or families that you could put in. And you can also find different ones online, but we'll get into that a little bit later within the course. So I'm gonna go into the doors folder, and this way I can find maybe some different doors that we can put in. Please note that these curtain wall doors can only be loaded in curtain walls. So we can't use any of these for the time being. We can pick up a couple of different ones here. So I do like, this one, I like that one for my um, little kind of sunroom, sitting room here. And I usually just will click on a door and use my, t my arrow keys on my keyboard to kind of shuffle through different ones. Let's try in the residential template itself. I can just find kind of one that I want to use for my front door. If not, we'll just use whichever one we got. I'll pick this one. Why not? seems like a good as any and I'll click on open even though this is an interior door so I shouldn't use it for my building but whatever and then I'll click on the size that I want to bring in so I'll bring in this three foot wide six foot eight inch tall and then I can place this door onto a wall notice how it's only going to allow me to place it when I put it on a wall because it is a wall based component so it needs a wall to host it if I don't like which way it swings, based on where I hover my mouse before I click, I can change the way that it's swinging in that direction. And I can also use the space bar to flip which way it goes. Even if, after the fact, if I click to place it and I dislike which way it's facing, I can use these arrows to flip it around. Nothing is really ever permanent when it comes to Reddit, so we can really kind of mess around and play around with some of those features. I'll do another door here. This one I'll load in another custom style-esque door. So I'm going to click on load family and I'm going to go back in my folders. So whenever you load something in, it's going to bring you right back into the last folder you ever used. So I'm going to look in and I'm just going to go back into the regular door folder because I did like this double glass door to put here. So I'm going to click on that one. I'm going to load in the six foot wide, six foot eight inch tall. And I'll click where I want it to be placed. If I want to move it, I could click on those numbers and I could move it around if I wanted to. And then I'll also put another door here in the bathroom, but I don't want to put, you know, a 
a glass six foot wide door in my bathroom. So I can choose here based on all of the doors I have loaded in to the one I want. And then I can click to place my door here. If I wanted to make a custom door, let's say I want to make this door, but I just, the size I want doesn't exist. We could go into edit its type and we can change things related to its width, its height, its materials, all of these different features. An important thing though, before you change any type parameters in here, you want to duplicate it first. So this way you keep the original three foot wide, six foot eight door, but then you can make a copy of it where you can change anything about it. I'm not gonna change anything about mine though at all. Um, if I wanna put a door in a curtain wall, it is a little bit of a more special kind of way of doing so. So I'm gonna hit escape twice so that way I can end the command in total. To load in a door for a curtain wall, you're gonna come up here to the insert tab and then you're gonna come into load family. Again, it's gonna bring me right into the last one that I ever used. And I'm just gonna load in a curtain wall single glass and click okay. That has loaded it into my project. And now if I want to install it within one of my curtain walls, what I'm going to do is go into my 3D view Pick the panel that I want to change into a door, which this can sometimes be a little tricky. So what I usually do is kind of hover over the edge of that glass panel, and then I use the tab key to shuffle through until I get that panel selected. And then I'm going to change its properties here, which it might not let me because this is pinned, but if I unpin it, there we go. So I needed to unpin it first, and then I can switch it to be a door. Doesn't look like a door here, but if I go into my ground floor plan, we can see now that it is in fact a door. I'm gonna do the same thing on my upper level. So I'm gonna go into my 3D view. Well, actually, hold on, I wanna inset this in a bit, so my bad. So, oops, I'm gonna go into my upper level. I'm gonna take this wall and I'm gonna inset it in here so that way I have a little balcony going on up here. I forgot what I wanted to do with it originally, but this make, gives me the opportunity to teach you a line, which is an important tool. So I'm going to click on this wall and I'm gonna use the align tool, which is up here or keyboard shortcut AL. And I'm gonna say that I want the face of this wall to be lined up with this. And it's gonna bring that wall in a little bit. And then I can hit escape a bunch of times. I could also just manually move this around using my keyboard um, by just using my arrows on my keyboard to move it. But what's gonna happen is when we go to put our second level or our floor in for our second level, we're going to put just a quick little cute balcony there. I just forgot about it for a second. <laughs> um, but I'll go back into my 3D view. And again, if I wanted to change one of these into like a door, just to go onto the balcony quick. And I'm going to hover over the edge of it and use the tab key to kind of shuffle through my selections. Click on this panel. Unpin it because of the fact that it was part of that curtain or that storefront, it got pinned, and then I can switch it over to a curtain um, door. I'm gonna go back into my upper level floor plan, and I'm just gonna flip the way that that opens, because it would make more sense for it to open inward, since this is gonna be a pretty narrow three foot space. And at this point too, within my second level, I don't need my underlay anymore, so I'm gonna turn that off. So I'm gonna hit escape a bunch of times, and I'm going to scroll down until I get to my underlay. It's about halfway down in that list. And for my underlay range, I'm going to say that I just want none and move my cursor out of there. So now my second level is just this flat area.
So at this point, we're ready to start adding in some windows into our building as well. There's two ways that I can do that. So if I go back into my architecture tab, I can add a window through the window tool here or keyboard shortcut WN. It works just like the door tool where we may have different windows that we want to load in or different sizes and styles that we want to load in. So it's one way we can do windows. Another way we can do them is we can actually do curtain walls for our windows and they're going to give a similar effect and sometimes particularly in renderings they tend to look a little bit nicer, a little bit more stylized in my opinion. Um, but to show you how the window tool works, so again I would either click on window or WN. By default we are given this fixed style window which is 36 inches wide, 48 inches tall. If we wanted to choose a different size, we can click on our properties bar and we see that there are a few of them listed in here, as well as a, there is a casement and a double hung loaded in by default. Um, or we could go into load family and we can choose a new window to load in, like a custom one. So for that, I would have to click back up here in this look in and I would have to go back into my US folder and then if I scroll down, we have windows and then we have some window types we can load in. Keep in mind this curtain wall awning could only ever get loaded in onto a curtain wall. Um, we could just do an, an opening or this one might be a new for 2024. So I kind of want to try it. I want to see if it's different than this one. Because why else would they list it as something different? So I'm just curious about this. So I'm taking you guys along on the ride with me. What is the difference between this window and this window? I don't know. Doesn't really seem like much. Um, but any, well, what I'll just do is I'm just going to do a two foot wide, four foot tall window. And I'm just going to place, you know, one, two, three, four. Let's say I have these windows here. We'll notice too how this spacing pops up or this dimension here pops up. So if I hit escape a bunch of times, if I wanted to change that, it looks like I already placed them, just eyeballing them to all be three foot six. If I wanted to kind of measure them around, I could use the dimension tool, which if I click here, that'll just place the dimension for us automatically. Or, I just deleted mine to get rid of it, so I just clicked on it and hit delete. Or, I could click on the Align Dimension tool, and I can measure from here to here to here to here to here, and then click to place it. Afterwards, if I wanted to change what any of these dimensions said, I can click on the feature it's referring to, the dimension, and then I could type in an amount. The feature it's referring to, the dimension, type in an amount. Feature, dimension, type in amount. And if I go look at it three-dimensionally, I now have those four windows sitting here on the building. If I wanted to put the same kind of pattern of windows on my lower level, what I would do is I would go into my ground floor Revit right now is prompting me saying, you've worked on this for pro like around 30-ish minutes. Do you want to save it? And I'll say sure thing. And I'm going to name it BSC1210-1. Dash, my last name all caps, my first name lowercase. Or actually there's no dash there. Oops. Dash. Revit residential. Forgot how to spell residential for a second. Keep in mind where you're saving it to. I'd recommend putting it on your flash drive or because this is my personal computer, I'm just gonna put it on my desktop for the time being. But if I wanna put windows on my first floor and keep that same spacing, what I would recommend doing is going into the window tool. So click on the button in the toolbar or WN and I'm just going to click 
to place this one I'll do a couple more windows on this side I'm actually just gonna do a whole big line of windows there I took no measurement at all of where I was putting them and now I'm gonna go look at the building from the south elevation so I could either double click on that triangle or I could have gone into the south elevation here and I'm gonna use the align feature to kind of either just click on these and move these over with my arrows. And then when it comes to these ones, I can use align, which again is keyboard shortcut AL. And I could say, I want this frame to line up with this frame. And I can also lock those together. And the benefit of locking aligned or at locking dimensions together is that if I decide I want to move this window, the other window moves along with it. And so again, I could either click on this window and use this tool or use just the keyboard shortcut AL. And I can say I want that edge to line up with that edge. I want that edge to line up with that, that to line up with that. And then for my dimensions here, what I would have to do is click on this window and say, I want this measurement to be three foot. Click on this window, I want this measurement to be three foot. I can't just click on here and now say, I want this to be three foot, because all it's gonna do is take this window and shift it back. So when you're working with these witness dimensions, you really have to kind of work your way down a line to really organize them a little bit. So this way, all of these windows are kind of lined up. Another way to work on windows that I like is to use a curtain wall as a way to stylize or show a window. And so if I go into my upper level and I just kind of pan over, I use my scroll wheel. What I can do instead is in my curtain or in my architecture tab, I can go into the wall tool and I can draw a curtain wall. So I'm gonna change my wall type to just curtain wall one. I'm going to actually remove my base constraint or I'm gonna have my base constraint as the upper level, but I'm gonna give it an offset of whatever I want my sill height. So let's say my sill height is two feet. So it's going to start my curtain wall two foot up and I'm gonna remove a top constraint. So I'm gonna say for the top constraint to be unconnected and I'm gonna give it a height of four foot eight. So four space, space eight. And then I can draw in where I want my window to be. If I want this to be a four foot wide window, it's warning me that these are overlapping, but that's totally fine. And then let's say I want another window here that's four foot wide. It's just given me that warning of, hey, these are two walls that overlap. The really cool thing with this then is I can do what's called a cut geometry. So I'm gonna click on this wall and I'm going to use the cut geometry tool. There is no keyboard shortcut for this. I have defined on my keyboard a keyboard shortcut for it, um, which you can do as well. If you go into the view tab, I believe, yeah, if you go into the view tab and you go into user interface, there is a list of all of the keyboard shortcuts and you can also define your own ones in there if you want. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So I click on this wall. I'm going to go cut geometry. I click on what I want to keep and I click on what I wanna cut out and it's gonna cut that curtain wall out. So we'll look at it three dimensionally is essentially I've made just a gap that is that curtain wall. And I have another one here so I can click on this wall, cut geometry, click what I wanna keep, click what I wanna cut out and it'll make that window look to it while what I wanna cut out and then if I want to even add in these mullions or this kind of aluminum around it, there is this tool here in the architecture tab for mullion. And I usually just use this all grid and I can just click on here to add in 
that Mullion feature. So that's another way I'll show a window within Revit. I think sometimes, depending on especially the style of the building, this is going to look nicer than this. And when it comes to the floor plan, it pretty much shows the exact same way as the window itself. Um, in fact, I think kind of line weight wise, this is a better option, but that's just my opinion and just a little trick of something that you could do. Next thing then that we're gonna look at in this video are gonna be how to add floors to our building. So we're gonna add a pretty large floor on our ground um, level. So I'm just gonna double click on the ground. I'm also going to, while I'm in here, I'm gonna adjust my view scale from the eighth inch to the quarter inch. And I'm just gonna move these in closer. So I'm gonna hover over these symbols and just drag them and drop, window around this symbol, drag it and drop. We'll also do this a little bit more towards the end, but I kind of like doing it as I work. So to add a floor into here, we're gonna put sort of like a larger deck around the building itself. So in this case, we're gonna use the floor tool, which is located right here, or keyboard shortcut. Actually, I don't think it has a keyboard shortcut. Let's check together, shall we? We'll go into the view, we'll go into interface, keyboard shortcuts, floor. So there is no architectural floor shortcut. We could assign a new one if we wanted to, but I'll just hit cancel. Now I know. So I'm gonna go into the floor tool by just clicking on it here. Whenever we go into tools like floors, roofs, ramps, stairs, we are gonna be tasked with creating some type of feature, which means we can't get out of this command until we either say cancel or please finish it. So if I go back into the architecture tab, all of my tools are grayed out because I can't do anything until I say, okay, please make this feature. Um, I'm going to make just a generic 12 inch floor we can, if we open this up, we can see that there are a few different types. So actually for this one, we'll do it. We'll put in a, I'll do it the lightweight concrete. Sure. I'll do concrete on a metal deck. Why not? It's weird for here, but we'll do it. Um, and instead of using the pick wall tool, which is just gonna make it based off where we've drawn, um, I'm actually just gonna use the rectangle tool and I'm just gonna draw from one corner to another one, I'm making in my patio or my deck. You'll notice that I didn't place any dimensions because this is just kind of playing around with some of the tools. We'll get more into all of those details later on. Um, and I'm just going to say, okay. And then I've made a floor. One thing that it's done, which I personally dislike in a floor plan, is because I have assigned a material to this floor, it has put a hatch pattern in. So I'm going to play around with some of my visibility so that doesn't happen because I personally just don't like it. So to change that visibility of what the floor looks like in this plan, I'm going to go into my visibility and graphics and click on edit in the floor plan. And then I'm going to go into my floors and I'm going to override the pattern on the projection. So I'm going to say, just please don't make a pattern visible at all. Click okay and I'll click apply. And we still have the boundary of the floor, but we just don't see that pattern. Another thing I like to adjust in floor plans is the cut. So I like to come in here and I'm just gonna scroll down till get to walls. And I'm just going to adjust the pattern for the cut in the walls. So I'm going to override that. And I'm going to say, please make it a solid fill with a color of, I usually choose this gray instead of this one. And I'll click okay, okay, and apply. And then it's just already given me that like poche look. Now keep in mind, these are only the visibility and graphics for just the floor plan. 
just those level ground floor plan. Which means now when we go into upper level, the walls don't have that solid fill. So again, that would be for this plan, I'd go into visibility and graphics. I'd scroll down to walls. I'd go into my cut pattern and I would say, please give it a solid fill of this light gray. I'll click OK, OK, and apply. This is also something that you can set up in a template by default. So it does these things for you. It has kind of these stylized features. This is not not a requirement. It's just something that I like. We actually aren't even going to have to worry about the floor in this particular review. And we'll see why in just a second. So with this, this one, we're going to make another floor in this view. And while I'm in here too, I'm going to adjust my visual scale to be a quarter inch equals a foot. If I can find it, there we go. I was hovering right over it. And I can change that down here or up here. I'm going to create another floor. This time, instead of drawing a rectangle, I am just going to use this pick wall tool and just click on the walls I want to make a floor based off of. And so I have these three here. I'm going to then just use the line tool to just draw in a fourth one here for my little balcony area. And then once I'm all done, I'm actually going to switch my floor type to just a generic 12 inch floor. And I'll say, okay, please make it. Whenever we go to make our floor, right now it's asking, do you want the walls underneath it to attach to its bottom? So it's saying because this floor itself is 12 inches thick, it's going 12 inches down and it is going to be overlapping a little bit the walls that we have on level one. So I'm going to click attach. This is just warning me about the curtain wall grid that I have over here. So I'm just going to click on delete. And when we go look at it three dimensionally, we have it just has adjusted this in order to make it fit a little bit better or a little bit nicer. The last thing then that we're going to do today in this video is we're going to work on our roof. So I usually am going to draw my roof within my upper level floor plan. And so in this plan, I'm going to use the roof tool, which is located right up here. There are two types of roofs that we could do. We could, if I click on that little arrow, we could do a roof by footprint, which is basically we define our roof based on the walls that exist, or we could do a roof by extrusion within a elevation view. So we kind of look at what we want the facade of that roof to look like. We sketch out a path. We could do either one of those. I'm going to do a roof by footprint. When I go into the roof tool, it puts me into a very similar menu from the floor tool in which I can either draw out my walls or I can also use this pick wall tool. We can also define an overhang beforehand. So if I wanted to, I don't have an overhang in this building, but I could do like a two foot overhang and then I could click on this wall and it's gonna have that overhang. I'm gonna control Z though, cause we don't have an overhang in this particular building. So for my boundary of my roof, I'm just going to click on all of the walls that I want associated with it. I don't have a wall here to click on, so I am just going to have to use the line tool to just draw one in. And you'll notice that each of these four have that little slope arrow to them. That means that all four of these sides currently have a slope which is not the style we want. We're gonna want a gable style roof. And then there's another problem too with this roof in which it's sitting with its base on the upper level. So while I have those two major issues, I'm still just gonna hit this green check to make my roof. And I'm gonna click on don't attach. And I'm gonna look at it 3D so we can see what this problem kind of looks like. So. Big issue is my roof is collapsed into the house. That one's a pretty easy fix. I can click on the roof, 
and I can change its base level to be roof. I could have adjusted it beforehand, but just to show you, if you don't, you'll be okay. Then my other problem is that it's not the footprint, it's not the style I want. I want a gable style roof. I currently have this hip style. So I'm gonna click on the roof and I'm going to say that I want to edit its footprint. And if I want a gable style with these two sides sloping, I'm going to click on this edge and I'm going to uncheck define slope. And I'll click on this edge over here and I'll uncheck to define its slope. And then what we have is a gable style roof. There's still one glaring problem. We can also adjust the slope and kind of play around with it there. I don't recommend doing that though. What I recommend instead is going into edit footprint, clicking on these sides and like defining your slope over here. So if I wanted like a 10 over 12, and I think, no. Can you please let me type it in? There we go. Because when you drag it, you're gonna get um, really wonky numbers. But we're just kind of making it up as we go. The last glaring problem with this roof here though is that I've got a big giant hole sitting in there. And so what I can do is fix that by clicking on a wall and using this function here to attach a top to a base, click on the roof, and it will bring that wall up to meet it. Additionally, if I do control Z, I can get the whole chain of these walls by hovering over this one, hitting tab, attach top to base, click on the roof, and we can especially see how it fixed that issue over here, that attach top to base function. And I can do the same thing with this curtain wall. I can click on the wall, attach top to base, click on the roof. It's gonna give me this error about how it can no longer make these mullions in that pattern. So I'll say that's fine, just delete it. And it just kind of readjusts the pattern to fit into that little area. And so that is a very basic overview of some of the functions of Revit. In our next video, we're gonna add in a staircase and some railing. We'll add in some components and a site as well as then look at how we can change some of the materials to do some renderings in the software.